Okay, we're going to be doing viruses now, and uh, this is a, a really diverse chapter. Um, we'll go into some things in a little bit more detail, like takeover of host cells in class. Um, here's a look at a variety of different viruses uh, and things that have to do with viruses. They come in a whole variety of shapes, a whole variety of hosts, different life cycles. They're much more diverse than one might think a virus would be. Um, there is a interesting shot down here at the bottom. You're looking at a, a scanning EM of red blood cells with influenza viruses attached to the outside. Gives you a nice size comparison. Um, this is a herpes virus right there. This is an Ebola virus, and this is a bacterial virus, and more influenza viruses. The view that you're looking at up here, the hieroglyph uh, from Egypt, um, look at the guy right here, and you will notice that there is something wrong with his leg, and he has a staff right here. I'll draw a parallel to it. He's using some sort of a cane. And this is the first recorded look at polio. Okay, so what about viruses? Um, let's go to unique features first. All right. They fit all of the things that you see here. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these. You can go over them. But a couple things that are of real importance here. Uh, one, no cell structure of any kind. They're not considered to be cells. Obligate intracellular parasites. And they're found in every other life form. Um, RNA or DNA? Not both. No enzymes for metabolism. They don't make ATP. Remember, they rely on a host. Nucleic acid can be double or single-stranded. And look at the size of these guys. To give you an idea, an E. coli cell is about maybe 0.2 by point. No, that's too small about uh, maybe 0.4 to maybe about 0.8 or 1 micron. Let's say 1 micron. And if I convert that into nanometers, which are values for viruses, you're looking at converting uh, 1 micron would be 1,000 nanometers. And 0.4 would be 400 nanometers. Now, E. coli is, a t is really a very small bacterial cell. Its width is about the same size as some of the largest viruses. But again, there are a lot of viruses that are way smaller. Uh, we'll get into some of the details of their structure in a bit. I've mentioned hosts and sizes already. Um, the view here uh, of the tulips on the bottom left, uh, these are tulips that are in infected by a viroid. Viroids, we'll talk about at the end, they are actually subviral in structure. They're even smaller than viruses. Um, and they are plant infectious agents. And that's what's calling, causing these pretty patterns on the leaves of the tulips. Then to the right of that is a tobacco, mo mo uh, toma uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, this is a tobacco leaf. And over on the left is a plant that's been infected. And on the right is a normal plant. And to the right of that is smallpox. Um, and above that is an E. coli cell with about, looks like maybe 15 viruses attached to the outside of it. I was trying to show you some of the variety of hosts 
uh, that viruses can have. Sizes and shapes is just a comparison of uh, viral and bacterial sizes. I'll let you look at that yourself if you want to stop this. Uh, capsid shapes, uh, these are the structures. Look at the up at the top too. And you will notice, um, get rid of that. Uh, look at the structure right inside here. This is called the capsid. It's covered by an envelope. This is the envelope right there. But forget the envelope right now. Um, the capsid is made of protein units. They look like little blue balls. Here is the other capsid structure. You can see that they have two different shapes. Icosahedral uh, is this shape on the left. And it's called icosahedral because it's made of triangular faces that make up the structure. Um, helical is the structure over here. It looks kind of like a slinky, one of those spiral slinkies that's compressed. Um, complex shapes, I'll show you in just a second, they fit neither of those. Um, then we've got uh, a variety of uh, nucleic acids on the inside, a single double-stranded RNA DNA. And we can have an envelope on the outside. That's what you see around each one of these viruses. So they're pretty uh, simple, structurally, that is. Uh, a lot of viruses do not have envelopes, by the way. Some different uh, some different shapes of viruses. Here's a look at some comp some different shapes of viruses. Um, here is icosahedral, 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 and the herpes over here, the last one, uh, has an envelope around it. Some helical viruses, helical. Uh, here's another helical right there. Look at the structures inside. And there's an envelope around it right out here. Um, complex shapes, uh, these two co guys right there. How are they classified? Well, they're not classified at all like bacteria or humans or cats or anything else. Um, they have taxons or uh, classification units, ranks, for viruses, but much abbreviated. So you've got families of viruses, a genus of a virus, a species of a virus. They don't look like the names you're used to. So they're about, oh, I don't know, a little bit more than a half a dozen, uh, sorry, a little bit uh, more than a dozen virus families of humans. Herpes viridae is one, which has the herpes virus in it. The genus is simplex virus, and the species is herpes simplex, too. So what you hear of as viruses like uh, rubella or rabies virus, that would be the species name. They're categorized based on five major criteria. The type of nucleic acid, double-stranded, single-stranded RNA, DNA, whether it has an envelope or not, size, shape, and what kind of host. So here you're looking at um, a breakdown of DNA viruses based on some criteria. And here is a classification key for RNA viruses. Replication. Um, I'm going to take you through a lytic replication. And this is one where the host cell is destroyed, lysed. So look at the cell right here. It's in um, yellow. And we've got a virus. This happens to be a bacterial virus. So get my, oops, here we go, there's my writing screen. Okay, so here's my host cell right here. This is the beginning of it. Virus is attaching here via receptor sites on the host cell. So if you look up here, you can see viruses attaching. Look at the specialized uh, receptor sites. Um, these are not receptor sites purely for viruses. They are receptor sites for other things. They could be 
um, on host cells of humans, they could be receptor sites for hormones, they could be receptor sites for neurotransmitters, they can be uh, just structures sticking off of the host cell, uh, whole for, they can be uh, viruses can attach to fimbrae of bacteria, so there's a whole variety of things they can attach to. Once attachment has occurred, um, the nucleic acid will go into the host cell. So there you see it right there. That's called entry. Then the host cell reads the genes of the viral genome and replicates, creates all the pieces of the virus. And then assembly, putting them all together. And then release. And there's your lysis of the host cell right there. Now there's some variations of that, but that's the basic one. Okay, I'm going to take you through the more detailed replication of bacteriophages. Um, if you um, look at the PowerPoint that is in eCampus, the real PowerPoint, there is um, there are a couple of good animations I've included in here. They have links. Um, if you click on this link up here, not in this video capture, but in the real PowerPoint. It'll take you over to McGraw-Hill's website. They have a really good uh, short animation on the T4-phage. It's one of the main viruses of E. coli. So, you see here um, the attachment stage right there. Then the entry of the nucleic acid. Now, something interesting happens. The nucleic acid of the virus has a code that directs the host cell to destroy its own chromosome. Now its own chromosome is right here in purple. Notice what's happened to it. It's been degraded. So this means that the virus now has total um, attention of its host cell. The host cell can't even read its own genes. Its genetic information is destroyed. It is totally given over to being an incubator for viruses. So the only genes it can read are viral genes. So now we have synthesis of the viral particles and assembly and then of course lysis right here. And down here at the bottom you see some of the steps of assembly. Um, these viruses are very bizarre uh, in their looks. At the top right you see a typical bacteriophage, that means a virus which infects bacteria. Uh, tail fibers for attaching to the receptors on the host cell. The capsid up at the top has got the nucleic acid. The view at the bottom, you've got three bacteriophages. One has all this loopy rope-like stuff that's exploded out of the capsid. That's nucleic acid. It's really jam-packed in there. Then in the middle, between those two views, you see a bacterial cell in the process of being destroyed by viruses. There must be 20, 25 viruses inside and outside of the host cell. Okay, now there's another variation of a replication cycle. I just took you through lytic, but let's go through a lysogenic infection. And this also can happen to bacterial cells. All right, so we start out um, with the virus getting in. So this is a different kind of virus that d than does a lytic cycle. It's called a temperate virus. So it now is attached. Notice that it has injected its own nucleic acid. Its nucleic acid is dark green. The nucleic acid of the bacterial cell is light green. Now, get my writing tools. All right. So this is nucleic acid of the virus right there. Notice what's going to happen. Let's go this pathway to the right. The nucleic acid of the virus now actually integrates into the host cell chromosome. It becomes part of the host cell. The virus has ceased to exist. None of the other stages occur. So you've got attachment and you've got entry, but there's no synthesis and there's no release and there's no lysis. Now, this infected cell, it is infected. It's carrying genetic info of the virus, but it's actually part of its own chromosome. It's called a prophage, uh, that virus stage where it's integrated. Whenever this mother cell divides into daughter cells, daughter cells get the same genetic info. Now, this is the way it can go on forever, nothing changing. However, something can activate and change things 
That change is called induction. Look at these large pink arrows. We can convert to a lytic infection. This is the lytic pathway. Something activates the virus and the viral information is now going to come out of the chromosome. It's going to be red and now you can see the cell has been lysed. So again, the lysogenic pathway can go on for any amount of time. It can also convert to a lytic pathway. Uh, lots of things can activate it. It could be temperature activation. It could be chemical activation. So there's not one thing. There's another important thing that can happen as a result of this. Let me bring up another picture. Okay, so here's a lysogenic infection starting over at the left. All right, now the bacterial chromosome is orange, viral chromosome is red. Notice that there's some recombination between the genomes of bacterial and viral genomes. So if you look at the third frame, notice that one of the viruses has picked up uh, the chromosomal information of the bacterial cell. And he's the one that infects the new cell on the far right. Now, there are three viruses shown coming out of or in the cell. One has viral information in red. One virus has some viral and some bacterial. But the one that's got the bacterial information in brown infects a new cell. Of course, that's a dead-end infection. The virus doesn't have any viral information. Notice, though, that the new cell now has inherited genetic info from the original bacterial cell that was infected. Remember, this is called transduction. Okay, so I've just taken you through stages of lytic infections and lysogenic infections in bacteria. Those were bacteriophages. Let's turn to animal replication. Now, I'm going to stop here um, because this is a longer section and we'll do video two.